So yeah, free oscillation. Mass and a spring, you deflect the mass, you let it run, and it goes backwards and forwards forever. Okay, following that equation of, of a sinusoid. So let's do some maths. Let's apply Newton's second law. Okay, well, obviously Newton's second law, all the sum of all the forces equals mass times acceleration. So there's my mx double dot, mass times acceleration, and the only force that's being applied to that system is a spring force. Now the force of a spring always opposes motion, so we've got a minus sign, and we've got a stiffness to that spring, which is denoted by k, and obviously the force in the spring is k times the deflection that you've inflicted upon it, so x. So we've got ma equals minus kx. There's no other forces on the system, so it's very simple. We put kx on the other side, so it becomes plus kx, okay, and then we divide everything by m. Zero divided by m is zero, so that disappears, and then obviously we've got x double dot, plus kx, no, sorry, plus k upon m times by x equals zero. This is one of the fundamental equations of all physics, as I may have mentioned in the first year. Did you have me for dynamics level one? Or did you have Gary? You have me. Yeah. <coughs> so you certainly did see that equation in the first year. And that solution applies providing omega is root k upon m. Okay? The natural frequency has to be root k upon m. And if that's the case, then this equation is a solution to that equation. We can check that. Okay? And we can check that by taking the derivative of x of t, okay, or double the second derivative, and then plugging it back into the equation, and we can find out that omega does in fact equal root k upon m. So there we are, we've taken the second derivative of that equation. And all that happens when you, when you take the first derivative of this equation, obviously it's cosine turns into minus sign, and an omega naught has to come out, because we've got to apply the chain rule. Okay? So we get an omega naught and a minus sign coming out. And then obviously you take the derivative of that, okay, the, the, the minus sign turns into minus cosine, okay, and another omega naught comes out. So we get minus omega naught squared times by essentially the same thing. Okay, so that's what happens. So we get minus omega naught squared coming out, and then notice that a cosine omega naught t plus phi is in fact x, so we can just write minus omega naught squared x. And if you plug that in for x double dot, you get this equation. And obviously the x's can cancel out, and you end up with omega naught being k, uh, omega naught squared being k upon m, so omega naught must be the square root of k upon m. Okay, so you can show that that equation um, is the solution to that problem. <coughs> now, so that's free oscillation. Okay, it's going to follow the sinusoidal motion, and, then, and we just showed that the equation of motion matches up with the, you know, the solution that we've got. Equation of motion was that differential equation with the time derivatives, okay? And the solution to that equation was the a cosine omega t. Now, force oscillation. We've got the same thing here, but this time, not only have I deflected it and let go, but there's a force being applied to that mass as well. So that force can be any sort of force. We'll talk, we'll talk about forces in a bit more detail in Chapter 3, okay? Lots of different types of forces. But here we're going to assume a, a, a sinusoidal force, okay? So, we, you know, I could deflect it and let go, but the thing is that there's a force that's going to be pushing it backwards and forwards, okay? And we're going to look at the equation. So, again, we apply Newton's second law, and this time mass times acceleration is the sum of two forces. We've got the spring force, because that's still there, that's not disappeared, and we have this force in f as a function of time, f of t. And that's the force that I'm applying to the system, or that is being applied to the system. And so again, we can rearrange it and put all the stuff to do with x on one side and then the force on the other side. And if, like I said, if I'm applying a sine of soil force, then it's going to be of this form, okay, f naught cosine omega t. Now, Notice the omega here does not have a subscript, okay? There's no subscript to that omega. And that is because that is the frequency at which I am driving the system, okay? It's, it's completely disconnected to the natural frequency. It's the fre frequency I've chosen that I'm driving the system at, okay? Um, so don't confuse the two because they're not the same. But omega without the subscript is the, force, is the driving frequency. So although the system might want to oscillate at, say, um, 10 radians per second, I want to drive it at 5 radians per second. So that's what I'm choosing, and that's what goes in here. Okay? 
So don't confuse the two. Omega naught, omega with a subscript, will not be the driving frequency of the system. Okay. I, will drive, I will choose that frequency myself, and that's what I'm going to drive it at. And so we're going to try and find a solution to this equation. And what we're going to do is we look at what happens as um, time goes to infinity. For this sinusoidal excitation, I'll just try, we're going to, you know, this is one of the methods of solving differential equations, is you try a trial solution. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in Chapter 3. But basically, your trial solution, in simple form, will be in the same form as whatever your forcing function is. Okay? Here we've got a sinusoid, so my trial solution will be a sinusoid at that frequency that, of which I've chosen. Notice omega still has no subscript there. So that's my trial solution. So I say, OK, well, I'm going to try x equals a cosine omega c. Let's find out whether that's a solution. Well, obviously, you take the second derivative of x, a cosine omega t. We get an omega coming out, um, and it turns into minus sine. You do it again, you get minus cosine, and then another omega comes out. So we end up with minus omega squared times by x. We plug that into the equation. OK. So we had, if you remember, we had mx double dot. OK, well, x double dot is minus omega squared, so that becomes minus m omega squared, plus k, OK, times by x, which is a cosine omega t, equals f naught cosine omega t. And obviously, I could switch this round just to make it clean, because I've got this little um, a minus sign out here, which, in fact, is a bit more comfortable. I feel a bit more comfortable if it's in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, equation. Um, just helps, doesn't it? Um, and then, like I said, this is my x term. Okay. Now, notice what I've got here is I've got a cosine omega t on both sides. And so if I cancel them out, If I cancel out the cosine omega t's and then rearrange solving for a, okay, you'll find out that um, a is f naught, whoops, f naught upon k minus m omega squared. So we've got a bit for a. So this trial solution's working because if we stick a in there, that in for a, we've got this solution, x of t is f naught upon k minus m omega squared times the cosine omega t. Now notice, okay, that the amplitude of oscillation has nothing to do with how far I deflected the thing to start with. Okay? Absolutely nothing to do. It's immaterial of what happens at the beginning of that motion. Okay? It's all entirely related to the force that's being applied, the amplitude of the force, force that's being applied, the stiffness of the spring, and the mass of the object. It has nothing to do with what happens at the beginning of that motion. Okay? It's defined entirely and empirically by the force that's being applied. Okay? <coughs> And again, the frequency at which it oscillates has nothing to do with the system. Okay? There's no natural frequency anywhere in here. This omega and this omega is the frequency which I'm applying to the system. Okay? So if you had a system that wants to oscillate, free oscillation, like I said, 10 radians per second. If I'm sticking at 5 radians per second, it doesn't matter what it wants to do, because okay? eventually, you know, um, we'll talk about transients in the next chapter, but eventually it's going to be oscillating at the frequency I'm giving it. Okay? It might fight it to start with, which is why you might get all sorts of things to happen at the beginning. But like I said, that bit of the frequency will die away and it will oscillate at 5 radians per second if that's what I'm forcing it to do. Okay. So that's the basic case of forced oscillation. Single degree of freedom and no damping. Like I said, A is no longer adjustable. It depends entirely upon the force that's being applied, the sinusoidal force that's being applied. And what we can do is we can look at how the solution changes as we alter the driving frequency. Okay? Now, it's quite clear that that's in the denominator down there. Okay? So as, as omega goes to 0, okay, that term disappears. But we end up with this equation, a equals f upon k. Now, that makes sense. If you think about the equation for a spring, okay, f equals minus kx, okay, Let's not worry too much about the minus sign. But A is an amplitude in terms of meters, isn't it? It's a distance. That's how far the thing oscillates backwards and forwards. And so K times my amplitude, or K times my deflection, equals the force that's being applied to the system. That makes complete sense. Yeah. If you deflect it by a certain amount, 
okay, this, the force that's being applied to the system is the force in the spring. Yeah? You let go, it's going to start oscillating. Okay? So that force being applied to the system is the spring force, K times my deflection. As omega goes to infinity, you can see, well, the bottom of this fraction is going to go to infinity. Okay? It doesn't matter what, how big K is, but if omega goes to infinity, the bottom of that fraction is going to be ginormous. And anything over a ginormous number is going to be zero. Okay, so as omega goes up and up and up and up and up, the actual amplitude of the oscillation will just go down to zero. Okay, and you can see that in lots of examples of when you, if, if something's, um, you know, for example, let's well let's think about a, a car suspension system. You can get rigs that will test suspension systems of car, but let's take a quarter of a car, which is you know one type of modelling stuff where you're applying a force to the suspension unit, okay? If you start at a low frequency, okay, the wheel's going to go up and down, and all that sort of stuff, lots, nice, nice and, you know, understandable. As the frequency goes up, you get all sorts of other motion in terms of the body of the car and the wheel and all that sort of stuff, the relationship starts to play into account. As the frequency goes even higher, okay, what happens is the wheel stops moving, okay? And, the, and obviously if the wheel stops moving, the car stops moving. And so you actually get an amplitude of zero, uh, if you go high enough in terms of frequency, and that's the that's what happens. Okay. If omega equals omega naught, okay. What you're hitting is you you may have heard of the term resonance. Okay. If you're driving the system at its natural frequency, the amplitude can potentially go to infinity. Okay. Often that doesn't happen because you've got damping, and that brings this down to a certain value depending on how damped it is. But obviously that can also be quite destructive if you've got a system and it's only got a certain length of amplitude, okay, and you start driving at its natural frequency, that amplitude wants to go as far as it can, okay, and obviously that leads to all sorts of things. There are advantages of driving a system at resonance, okay, certain advantages in certain situations, but generally you want to avoid that system, okay. Imagine you had a, a, a jet engine attached to your wing of an aircraft, okay, and that structure will have a certain natural frequency, okay, is, you know, the, although it's a rigid structure, it's a piece of metal, so it will stretch under tension, act like a bit like a spring. Now, if you drive your jet engine at a frequency at which matches the natural frequency of that structure, obviously the, thing, the amplitude of that vibration is going to want to get the amplitude to go to infinity. That's a bad thing. Okay, so you don't want to drive your jet engine at the natural frequency of the structure that's holding the jet engine down, because otherwise your that system will fail and the jet engine will fall off your aircraft. So. That's a, you know, that's a typical engineering example of why you want, might want to avoid resonance. This is a situation where you might want to uh, you know, match resonance. Okay? A few years ago, I did a little bit of work on wave energy converters, you know, basically devices that you put in the sea um, that oscillate up and down, another dynamic situation. Okay, and that converts that oscillation into energy that you can then generate electricity from. Now, the thing is with C, it varies in terms of frequency, but generally, most of the time, 95% of the time, you can be pretty sure of the frequency of the oscillation of the waves, okay? Obviously, there'll be situations and storms and stuff where it won't match that frequency, but most of the time, you can match the frequency. And what you want to do to maximize the energy conversion is you want to make your system, okay, have a, this is now the driving frequency, that's the waves. You want to make the natural frequency of your system match that of the waves because then you can generate most electricity. And there are various methods you can employ to make to adapt your system so that you can change what omega naught is of the system, okay? But essentially, you want to try and match it to the driving frequency of the waves, and then you can maximize your energy conversion. Okay. So that's an example where you want to take advantage of resonance. Okay. So if we were to take these equations, okay, and start plotting them on a graph, you get this sort of thing going on. Okay, so R is frequency and ratio, which is omega over omega naught. So when your driving frequency matches the natural frequency, you're at R equals 1, okay? And obviously, if your driving frequency is two times your natural frequency, you're at R equals 2. And M is known as the um, amplitude ratio, okay? When M is 1, you're at static deflection, F naught upon K. Okay, if we go back to um, there. When, a, when omega's naught, you've got F naught upon K. That's known as static deflection. Okay, because the system's not going to oscillate, you're just deflecting it, and the force that's being applied is equal to the spring force. And when, and basically that ratio, m, okay, is the actual amplitude, a, divided by the static deflection. So you end up with, uh, when 
you're at static reflection, m equals 1. And obviously, as the amplitude goes up, that will increase um, to 2 and so on. And you can see that what happens is you start off at zero frequency and you head up to the natural frequency, the amplitude will increase, and that goes off to infinity. And what happens is, as you go beyond it, it comes back from infinity, and will then settle off at zero, okay? But notice it's coming back from the other side. And that means if you're driving your system above the natural frequency, it's actually responding opposite to what you're driving it at. Okay? So I'm, if I'm driving it like this, okay, the system is actually responding in the opposite direction. Okay? So I, I might be applying a force this direction, but the thing's moving this way. It's quite confusing, but basically that's what will happen. It's 180 degree out of phase with your um, driving force. So if you drive it one direction, it's actually responding the other way. Up to your natural frequency, it will be in the same direction. Okay. That's why it's minus. And we'll cover that in the next section when we're talking about more force oscillation with the damp system, because you can see that quite clearly.